Cooler Master's SK Series mechanical keyboards help you keep a low profile with ultra-flat double-shot keycaps and a slim, minimalist design. Available in full-size trim as the SK650 or the even more portable 10 keyless SK630, these keyboards feel great thanks to genuine Cherry MX low-profile mechanical switches. They've also got a durable brushed aluminum top plate and a detachable and braided USB Type-C cable, so click the sponsor link in the description for more on the Cooler Master SK630 and SK650. What's up guys, welcome to Probing Paul. This is episode number 33, and this is the monthly Q&A that I do every month at the end of the month usually. It's the end of February right now, so uh, th I usually start out by looking at the past history of Probing Pauls, going back through the sands of time. Uh, it's, it's very mysterious back there. There's a playlist if you guys want to check it out and watch old episodes. For today's episode, I'm answering questions that were asked in the comment section of last month's video, so if you want me to answer your question next month, then comment down below, and perhaps I will. First question here is from Jean-Nicolas Charest, and he says, in your opinion, what percentage of the price tag for PC components, uh, such as RG GB, RAM sticks, fans, SSDs, is for aesthetics versus the item's actual real value. Also, first time I'm probing Paul, so welcome and thank you for the initial probing. I, it's always great the first time. I would say 10%, if I'm just going to throw a number out there. But my thought process on this like vacillates wildly between the way I used to think about it, which is that you shouldn't spend any money or concern about aesthetics. You should only be focused on how fast your computer can actually be. Because for a lot of people, they build a computer and then they tuck it away and they don't really think about it. The performance is more important than what it actually looks about. But I've sort of changed my philosophy over the years, and this is largely in part because building a PC for yourself now is more of a personal thing. You're customizing it for yourself. You're making it unique to you. And I think those aesthetic touches are the things that can do that and make your PC more like the PC you built versus something you just bought off of a store shelf somewhere. 10% seems reasonable to me because it's not too much. The one thing I would really stay away from is investing like say 80 to 150 to 200 dollars on something like sleeved cable extensions or an all-in-one liquid CPU cooler that doesn't improve your performance that much but just looks nicer. If you could have taken the money you spent on an aesthetic upgrade and go from say like an RX 580 to a GTX 2060 for example, you'd be much better off spending the money there on improved performance over aesthetics. That said, I do think it is worth spending some money on ERGB or just whatever it is that you feel looks good. Often the case is a big factor there. People will spend 10, 20, 30 bucks more in a case because they like the look of one over the other. But all things considered, I think it ultimately boils down to performance. So if you're trying to decide, should I go for aesthetics or performance, go for performance. Next question is from Ricky V. He says, hey Paul, since you're about to hit 1 million subscribers, would you talk about the shit times and what your journey on YouTube has been like for these past 10 years? It's been an interesting journey. I'd say because I started out with Newegg and we built Newegg up to the point where it was somewhere between 400 and 500,000 subscribers when I initially left. And then when I went and started doing things on my own, it was kind of like starting over to some extent, so I had to kind of build my way back up. That said though, I think there are three times that stand out to me as being the most challenging when it comes to my 10 years making YouTube videos. The first was when I was back at Newegg, and it was towards the end of my time there, and it was just things weren't going well. And I'm not going to go into the details of why that was, but it was just frustrating because when you're doing creative work, it's very, very helpful to be able to stay in a positive mindset, and it was just challenging uh, towards the end of my time there. So again, sorry for the lack of details, but the upshot was that that encouraged me to go and branch out on my own. And now that I am on my own, there have been other challenges. So the second challenging thing that pops up would be right after I branched out and was working on my own and just sort of the different set of challenges that come along with working from home, working for yourself, uh, making your own schedule. I'm not always the most responsible and focused person. I'm easily distracted, so I think for the first year that I was working from home, I was just sort of learning some more things about myself. What sort of motivates me to get work done? What can sort of hold me back from getting work done? Fortunately, things are much better now. I'm much better at staying focused and getting the work done that needs to be done, and I think I learned something about myself and became a better person in the process, hopefully, a little bit, so that ultimately turned out to be a good thing as well. The third thing I'll bring up, and I'm only going to mention it briefly because it was legitimate the most difficult thing that I've ever gone through in my life was at the beginning of last year in January of 2018 my wife who was about three months pregnant at the time found that uh, we weren't gonna be able to keep the baby we lost our baby it was really 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 hard and I went for there a few months of pretty severe depression because of that and it was really challenging to get the videos done um, so I'm not trying to get too dark at the beginning of the video here or anything but that was definitely the most shit time in my experience of the 10 years I've been doing YouTube although it was somewhat unrelated it definitely 
definitely affected my ability to keep making videos. The good news though, the positive news, is that my wife and I are pregnant once again. We are due later in April, and we're having a girl. So, uh, look forward to that. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make my channel into a baby channel or anything like that. Next question here from Derp of all things. With Ryzen being out for two years now, uh, first gen Ryzen is cheaper. And yes, that is, it can often go on sale. Should I buy the Ryzen 5 2600, the Ryzen 7 1700, the Core i5 8400K, or maybe uh, something else similarly priced? His focus is gonna be gaming, maybe streaming, maybe some workstation tasks, and light video editing at 1080p. So first of all, there is no such CPU as the 8400K. I kinda wish there was, that would be cool. Intel would be nice if they did something like that, cause that's a problem with Intel for me, is that when I'm trying to tell somebody, here, buy these parts and build this computer, my thought is that they're gonna build a computer for the first time, and then maybe they're gonna like it and get excited about it and wanna do other stuff with their computer, like putting aftermarket cooling on or overclocking. Overclocking can be a lot of fun. It's a great way to squeeze some extra performance out of your system that you couldn't get otherwise, but Intel locks down overclocking and you have to buy a K-SKU processor in order to do that, and all the K-SKU processors are very expensive. Beyond that, Intel, at least with their 8,000 series, or their 9,000 series of processors, cut hyper threading out of a lot of the higher end SKUs that are out there. So you have six core, uh, six thread CPUs and eight core, eight thread CPUs. To get a full eight cores and 16 threads, you have to spend over 500 bucks for a 9900K. So that's why I haven't been recommending Intel quite as much, but if your focus is purely on gaming, you want the best single core performance possible, and for that, you definitely want to go with Intel. That said, if you want to do mixed use stuff, like you're talking about, here, then you'll definitely benefit from those extra cores and threads that you can get from like a 2600 or a 1700. So I would say go with the Ryzen based on your use case scenario. Beyond that, the 2600 I think would be a slightly better choice for gaming because you are going to get a little bit better single core performance out of that. The 1700 is going to have two more cores and four more threads, so if you're talking about your video rendering tasks, it'll do better at that. So consider which of those two is more important to you, and then of course reality check current pricing because... But I don't know, I, like I can't give you a direct answer to this. When the 2600 is 165 bucks and then the 1700 is also like 170 bucks or something, like I, I, I honestly don't know what to tell people. It, how much time are you gonna spend rendering? How much time are you gonna spend gaming? One or the other. Next question from Jack Carnell. A simple question, but a very important one. Why is RGB so popular. Check out my RGB PC back here, Arctic Panther. Uh, it's got RGB lighting right now, it's all white because it's winter time. And one thing I've enjoyed with my computer back here is sort of updating it as the seasons change. And with RGB lighting, you can go in there and you can have a computer that looks like one way one day and then you can have it look like an, another way another day and you can color code it with all the stuff on your desk. And I think it's just a way that you can customize a computer and then change it over time because people don't want things to be one way all the time anymore. And I think that's why we've seen such a proliferation of RGB in everything. And I know some people hate it, and I don't blame you if you're not into it. I completely understand people who just want something that's like all blacked out or maybe like a, a two-tone color scheme or something like that. But when it comes to long-term flexibility and just being able to, on a whim, say like, oh, I want my computer to look like this today, RGB lighting is a pretty cool way to do that. Next question from The Fat Man. In all the time you have been in tech, which launch had you the most hyped or excited, like a kid on Christmas morning? And are there any launches that are upcoming that might make me feel this way? Um, as far as like a kid on Christmas morning, upcoming launches, Kind of, maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see the new Ryzen 3000 series stuff because that's pretty imminent and it does seem like they're gonna really be cranking up the number of cores and threads that you can get on a mainstream platform. So that's cool. I would say the stuff historically that I've gotten most excited about has been like the high-end desktop stuff. I had an X58 motherboard and an Intel Core i7-920 back in the day when they first differentiated and made a high-end desktop platform along with a mainstream platform. So back then, I got pretty excited about that. More recently, Threadripper coming out two years ago was what really made me think like, oh dang, that's really cool. Because for one, they didn't transmit at all that they were even working on that. It kind of came out of nowhere. And then Intel, I feel like, was pretty blindsided. And suddenly you had AMD competing not just on the mainstream with Ryzen, but also in the high-end desktop space. And I think it's really changed Intel's approach to that. We have much more high core count processors there now, as well as on the mainstream. So. Yeah, I'd say high-end desktop launch, if I can make it generic. 
back in the day with X58 when Intel first did it, and more recently with Threadripper when AMD did it. Just a few questions left. This one from Xenonuke who asks, can you do a step-by-step -step PC hardware maintenance video? He really enjoyed the build guides and the maintenance videos that he found on YouTube aren't very in-depth, like redoing thermal paste and that sort of thing. So Xenonuke, this is good timing because I just recently have been posting my updated how to build a gaming PC video series. Uh, part one and part two are currently out. Part three should be up in another day or two. And the response to that has been very positive. So thank you for the idea. I think it's a good one. And I have been thinking about uh, following this video up with some other videos that are more down the tutorial path, but maybe a little bit more specialized in certain areas. So I think a maintenance video would be a great idea. I need to find a computer that's like super clogged up with dust and stuff. So I actually think my wife's computer hotbox would be a great option for that. So uh, thank you. These are great ideas and you'll probably see a video like that coming out for me sometime soon. Here to levitate me has a comment rather than a question, but I wanted to pull it up because it's relevant to a question I answered last month about RAID. And he's pointing out that RAID 1 is not a backup solution. It is an uptime solution. Now the phraseology here makes me think that here to levitate me is familiar with uh, like a server environment or a data center environment. And this is very true. The main point being made here is that if you have RAID 1 set up, you have a backup, and I see I'm already using the, the wrong word here, you have a secondary solution to get your data back if one of those drives fails due to a hardware failure. However, if you get malware or other corrupted data or you get a virus that's on the drives, um, you're going to lose the data on both drives if it's the type of, of drive that does that. So for that reason, you definitely want to look into a more actual legitimate backup solution. So if you're looking for something entry level, just like a network attached storage hard drive that's connected somewhere to your network that you simply drop stuff onto so you have data saved in more than one location is a possible solution. More than that though, you'd want to set up something like FreeNAS that has automated backups and especially it's got read-only automated backups so even if you were compromised you'd still be able to recover your data off of those so thank you here to levitate me and hopefully that makes things a little bit more clear for you guys who aren't as familiar with raid one Kristen H just really briefly pointed out the black ops 4 build that I did last month and I have to tell you guys that it has been given away and the winner has claimed their prize here is the build itself it turned out super nice I'll put a link in the description if you want to see me put it all together but uh, the claimants the, the winner has claimed their prize and uh, just in case you're wondering how long it takes in a giveaway situation like this to actually receive a prize I am going to be shipping this out tomorrow. Uh, I had to coordinate with ASUS. ASUS had to get their information. When you give away something that's of a value, I believe, over like seven or eight hundred dollars in the U.S. at least, it actually counts as like paying that person money. So that means you actually have to get the tax information from the winner so that you can send them a 1099 for next year's taxes. Um, that's just how it works in the U.S. if you're doing things properly. So. All that said, the winner accepted the prize, gave the information, ASUS got it, they sent me shipping labels, I now need to pack up the pack, well, it's all packed up, I need to put the ship shipping labels on the boxes and ship that out, which I'm gonna do tomorrow. The last question here isn't a question, it's a comment, it's from Pappy Man, and I pulled this up because it, it, it was such a kind comment. Also wanted to sort of give a flip side to the one million views thing that I'm kind of teasing in this video since it's gonna happen real soon, I'm at over 995,000 subscribers as of the filming of this video, and Pappy Man, I feel like he just encapsulated a lot of the stuff that I'm all about. Uh, I completely agree with you. I am not as tech specific as Steve or even like Hardware Unbox. They do a lot more in-depth benchmarking and testing than I do. But my mainstreaming descriptions he likes, uh, quick fire advice, I try to be thorough, I try not to mislead people, and I try to give you guys direct, honest information that I would hope to receive myself if I was looking to find more information on building a computer and getting advice on that topic. So thank you very much, Pappy Man, for this comment. I, it, 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 it got me, it got me right there. I was like, yes, you you understand what I'm trying to do here. So thank you, uh, thank you all for subscribing to my channel. I'm really, really looking forward to hitting a million subscribers and getting the plaque and all that good stuff. I will be doing a follow-up, probably a giveaway on that, and then another follow-up on that later on. I'm probably gonna wait till I get the plaque for that. But um, that is all the time I have for this video. Thank you guys so much again for watching and leave me comments in the comment section if you want me to answer them in next month's Probing Paul in March, which is, well, March starts tomorrow, but I'm probably not going to do it till later in the month. Thanks again for watching, though, guys. We'll see you next time.